Okay. Mm, did you receive the um, PDF? Yeah. Did you send me the email? Yeah, later in the night. <laughs> I will send back the fact that it's I will send back the document today. Okay. So today uh, we we'll start our discussion with the concept of the Gaussian wave packet. Okay. Now, as you know, uh, if you have a particle in classical mechanics, uh, you can describe. Uh, for instance, in three dimensions, it, with its coordinate x, okay? Um, and obviously, its velocity as well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know that the dynamics follows then some uh, <coughs> Hamilton's equation or Newton's equation doesn't really matter how you write it. You can write as a first order equation. So there is some Hamiltonian hmm? in non relativistic single particle physics. This is kinetic energy plus some potential. Hmm? And you can write the dynamical equations, Hamiltons, Newtons, the way you want. Okay, so this will describe uh, some, some trajectory. Hmm? Now, there is a crucial, so this is classical. But it's a crucial uh, difference in classical physics. For if I have a, 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 a particle at a certain point in quantum mechanics, I will describe it by some function, some wave function psi of x. In general, a complex object. Okay. So if I want to draw it, it would be very difficult. But for instance, let's consider the modulus square of this object. Okay. This is, in fact, a very uh, important information in quantum mechanics. It tells you the probability that the particle is at a certain position, x. Hmm? Now, uh, as in classical mechanics things move, and you have some x of t, here you will have a wave function that depends on position n time. Okay? And it also moves somehow. Okay? So, you see the crucial <coughs> difference. Here, to describe the particle, I need very few information, very few variables, the position and the velocity. Here, I need a function, which is an infinite amount of information. Okay? So, immediately you see that doing quantum mechanics is enormously more complicated, huh? if you have, for instance, to do it on a computer, than doing classical mechanics. Hmm? Even for a single particle, I need to follow an infinite amount of information, which is the wave function as it moves in time. Okay? Now, I, I, I want to go softer, however. Right? So let's start, um, let's start in one dimension. Okay, so suppose that we are describing something that occurs in, a, in, in one dimension. And uh, let's see how we can write a function which, in some sense, should describe a particle. So I want something, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> I want a function which describes a particle. For instance, a good set of functions, OK, which you can use are the so-called plane waves, which obviously are cosine kx plus i sine kx. Now, would this be a good way to describe a particle? Obviously not by itself, right? Because uh, the, these are periodic functions. Okay? So if I look, for instance, at the cosine, hmm, you immediately see that this object has a period, okay? the wavelength, lambda, how much is the wavelength if I write the function in this way? Huh? One over k. Yeah, two pi over k. Okay. Uh, if you are, um, if you want to check this, write this as cos 
2 pi over lambda times x. Okay? Good. Now, if you add here lambda, okay, you are summing 2 pi. Okay? So you immediately see that at any point x and x plus lambda, you have the same function. Okay? Good. So, this, which is called the wave vector, is nothing but a convenient way of writing the wavelength of this wave, which is a, wave, a periodic object. So it doesn't describe the particle here, because the particle might be here, 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 anywhere in space. So not really something that looks like a particle, a classical particle moving. But, as you know, there is a tool hmm, which is called Fourier transforms. Okay? You can write any function, hmm, any function psi of x as an integral over all case, hmm, <coughs> from minus infinity to plus infinity, hmm, uh, of an appropriate weight times the plane waves that I told you. Okay, so you multiply the plane waves by some weight, and you sum many, many, many of those waves with different weights. Okay? Properly you integrate. Mm -hmm. Okay? For reasons that are just, uh, I mean, it's comfortable to put just the square root of 2 pi here. Okay? So this is essentially um, the Fourier transform of this function. Mm -hmm. And you know very well, by the theory of Fourier transform, by the way, we will revisit a little bit later some of this concept, but I just want to flash them to you now, that if I give you some sign of x, you can calculate for me what is the phi which uh, reproduces it, okay? The phi, okay, is calculated by just integrating over x, your psi of x, okay? And the only thing that you have to do is you have to multiply by the minus sign k of x, okay? So, and again, this is very symmetrical. You put the square root of 2 pi there as well, okay? So this is, in fact, nothing but a Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform, okay? Is it clear? Good. So, every function, hmm, can be written in terms of uh, some, some of its Fourier transform. And you know also that it does exist, there, there exists a theorem that is called the Plancher theorem that tells you that in this way, somehow the normalization, we'll comment on this later on, is uh, concerned. So the total integral of the modulus square of the wave function, which we'll see later on, is the total probability you know, for finding the particle anywhere in space. This is equal to the total integral over k of the weight function phi of k. Okay? They are exactly the same. And we will see that somehow phi of k will be the probability of measuring a certain momentum, a certain uh, momentum k. But this we will see later on. For the time being, let's be superficial. Just a mathematical tool, Fourier transform. Okay? Very good. Now, let's proceed a little bit more. I want to be concrete. So this is uh, very general, but let's see what happens hmm, if I use uh, phi of k hmm, being some constant times e to the minus alpha k minus k zero squared. Okay? Then you write something like this, you call it a Gaussian. Okay? Phi of k mm, is centered at some k zero with some Gaussian form. Is it clear to everybody? Okay? This is um, the phi of k. And the width of this Gaussian is controlled by alpha. Hmm? Let's see. The larger is alpha, what happens? Let's see. If alpha increases, this becomes narrower. Okay? 
if alpha decreases, this becomes okay. So alpha decreases becomes like this. In fact, for alpha equals zero, it's very very flat. Okay. So alpha controls how narrow this object is in wave vector. Okay. Now let me uh, insist that I want the integral of this thing, okay, the modulus square of this thing, hmm, to be one. Okay? I told you that there is this Plancher theorem that tells me that the modulus square of this integrated is equal to the modulus square of this integrated, and I fix it to be one, which simply fixes a certain constant c, which depends on alpha in such a way that the integral is uh, one. Okay? Hmm. Now to do these calculations, we will need a little bit of uh, gymnastic of Gaussian integrals. Very, very simple, huh? but let me just recall it to you. Okay. You probably remember that if I have the following integral, integral dk over square root of 2 pi e to the minus k squared over 2, hmm? This integral is exactly 1. OK? You've probably seen it already. And in fact, um, you can uh, massage it into several different forms. For instance, the, the way I, I, I recall it, that you, you can write, in general, the following thing. If I put here some uh, a factor sigma k squared, hmm, then this integral is still equal to 1. Okay? These two objects are obviously almost the same with a change of variable just called k over sigma k equal to, say, y. Hmm. You see, these are just the, the same integral with a change of variable. Hmm. Uh, this interpretation, however, tells you that if I have a Gaussian hmm, uh, and uh, you see immediately from here that sigma k is nothing but the width of this Gaussian. Now directly proportional, not inversely proportional as before. So this is somehow the width of the Gaussian. Mm -hmm. The correctly normalized Gaussian uh, here uh, needs some square root of 2 pi sigma k squared. Okay? Fantastic. Obviously you can uh, mm, play with this thing. Hmm? Uh, and for instance, we're just using this thing, you can calculate that um, C hmm, here should be equal to 2 alpha over pi to the power of 1 fourth. Okay? It's a very, very simple calculation. Try to do it. Hmm? Okay. Um, even more, hmm? Uh, you can calculate, for instance, let's, let's try to put this function with the correct normalization in this standard Gaussian form. Let's see. You would say phi k modulus square is equal to c square. Let's put this to be just, everything here is real for, for simplicity. So c is real, c square e to the minus 2 alpha k minus k0 squared. Okay? So, how do I put it in this uh, nice Gaussian form? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> just let's insist that this is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma k squared e to the minus k minus k0 squared divided by 2 sigma k squared. Okay? What is <coughs> sigma k? Mm -hmm. Well, you can verify that sigma k squared is 1 over 4 alpha, OK? And just I mean, a little bit of algebra, very, very simple, OK? So the larger is alpha, the smaller is sigma, and the more narrow is the Gaussian and vice versa. OK, good. Now, by the way, by the way, uh, you know that if I ask to calculate what is the average value of 
the difference of k from k0, remember I do have a center momentum k0, and I ask you for this average, what is the average? Average with the Gaussian, so the integral over k hmm, with square root of 2 pi sigma k, k minus k0 square e to the minus <coughs> um, k minus k0 square over 2 sigma k square. Okay, so this is the phi modulus square. Okay? So if I ask you, given this amplitude phi modulus square centered uh, in k0, what is the average spread hmm, of k from k0? Well, the answer is sigma k squared. Okay? The second moment in probability. No, well, you have seen these things uh, many times, probably. Okay? Standard things that follow quite easily uh, from Gaussian integral. By the way, if you want to obtain this integral from that, all you have to do with the trick that we saw yesterday is to formally define here this parameter as some parameter beta and take a derivative. Okay? So if you uh, take appropriate derivatives with the, whatever parameters you have here in front, okay, then from this integral you derive immediately this. Okay? Okay. Um, now, <coughs> uh, what I really need, okay, let's see. I need to calculate this, however. So, given this function here, I want to calculate what is the psi of x connected to it, okay? So, here I would have hmm, something like the phi that I wrote before, so um, something like e to the minus uh, k minus k0 squared times alpha, okay, times c. So, I need to learn how to do Gaussian integrals with this uh, complex phase here, okay? So, somehow I need to learn how to do the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, okay? Which is a little bit more than what we wrote here. Let's, let's learn this, okay? So, to do that, I still insist a little bit on the uh, Gaussian integrals. Mm? So suppose that I want to put a factor A here, okay? Uh, can you tell me how much is this integral? Huh? 1 over k. 1 over square root of A, okay? The reason is that, again, you can change variable a square root of k equal to y, hmm? and you see if you change variable, this is what you get. Okay? So if that integral before was 1, if you put an a here, it's 1 over square root of a. Fantastic. Hmm? Now, um, I can prove rather easily that if I write this, the following integral, integral over dk over square root of 2 pi, uh, e to the minus a k square over 2, times e to the k j. j is now some real number, whatever, okay? 3, 72, whatever you want, okay? Uh, now, this integral is slightly different, you see? For j equals 0, uh, I have it. For j different from 0, what should I do? Hmm? There is a trick. Complete the square. Okay? This is somehow, it's like when you add a linear term to a parabola. It's a shifted parabola. Okay? And here you have added, remember, you can write this like this, right? So you have a parabola that is a little bit shifted. Just complete the square and try to see what is the square coefficient and do a little bit of algebra, very, very simple, okay? It's done in the footnotes here and you can prove that this is 1 over square root of a e to the j square over 
2a. Okay? It turns out that this is exactly the completion of this uh, parabola. Okay? Fantastic. This is very useful. Okay? So this single integral contains a lot of information. Hmm? For j equals 0 reproduces the old one, but it tells me a little bit more. In particular, you should notice that there is no need for j to be real. It could have some complex part, some imaginary part. Why? Because after all, the integral over k, remember this is from minus infinity to plus infinity, still converts. Because this, okay, is a real thing that, that goes to zero very fast, okay? So even if this uh, oscillates a little bit, who cares? For very large k, the integral converts. So the formula that I wrote before is correct, even if j is complex, okay? This is a remarkable thing. And in particular, I can substitute ix, purely imaginary. Okay, let's see what comes. Integral over dk, square root of 2 pi, from minus infinity to plus infinity, e to the minus a, k squared over 2, uh, e to the i, k, x, equal to 1 over square root of a, e to the, the square of this is minus x squared divided by 2a. Okay, this is equally useful. Okay, it's the same formula in fact. But now it's teaching you the following thing. If I have a Gaussian and I Fourier transform it, its Fourier transform is a Gaussian. Okay, very, very simple. But, you see the role of A. A is here in the numerator, here in the denominator. Okay, so you invert what is narrow here is wide here and vice versa. Okay? So if the weight function is narrow in momentum space, in k-vector space, then the resulting Fourier transform is wide in space and vice versa. Okay? This is just Fourier transform. It's nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Okay? So it's uh, all in classical physics whenever you have waves and you you do things with weight. Okay? Free. All free. All right. Let's, let's use this, this, this uh, fact. Mm? And uh, um, so, I mean, essentially, if I ask you, okay, now, I have this wave function, which is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian centered in K0. Can you tell me what is the result? And you can tell me immediately. Of course, I know that formula. And then I calculate it for you. Okay, let's see. Let's perform the calculation explicitly. Okay. I do it slowly, uh, although for some of you it's too slow. But uh, at least at the beginning, I don't want to. So, by the way, if you still have doubts, ask, okay? Don't be afraid. Okay, this is the calculation I would like to do. Mm -hmm. The formula here has k squared, not k minus k0, okay? Can you invent the solution for this? Change of variable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So if I change of variable, I, uh, I, I can write this as k minus k0 plus k0, okay, times x. Mm -hmm. I can bring this term outside, okay? I write as c e to the i k0x, and then I have an integral uh, uh, over dk square root of 2 pi e to the minus alpha k minus k0 square e to the i k minus k0 times x, okay? Now I can call this object whatever, k tilde, okay? And this is k tilde. And integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity in dk or in a shifted k tilde is exactly the same, right? So the result of this calculation by now using that formula is the following. Um, 
Uh, I am now using, remember that the C has a precise expression in order for the thing to be normalized. So it's 1 over 2 pi alpha to the power um, or fourth. And then it is e to the i k0x, which comes from this thing. And then the integral gives, um, well, the integral gives factors that uh, I have all uh, captured here. And then it gives me the most important thing, which is this, okay, which is 4 alpha. Okay? Uh, why 4? Because you see here I have alpha. So if I call this alpha according to that formula a over 2, hmm, then here I should have 2a. But a okay, is 2 alpha already. a equal 2 alpha to use that formula. So here I have essentially 4 alpha. Okay? Fantastic. Okay. <clears throat> Let us insist, okay, let's calculate the modulus square of this quantity. The modulus square, you see this phase factor in front, doesn't contribute, doesn't really matter. This gives you the oscillation if you look at the real part or imaginary part, but the modulus square doesn't care at all about it. And the modulus square is um, 1 over square root of 2 pi alpha times e to the minus x0 divided by 2 alpha. Okay? I just take the square of this, which is a factor 2. Mm -hmm. Now, I insist again in writing this as 1 over square root of 2 pi a sigma in x space times e to the minus x squared divided by 2 sigma in x space. Hmm? How much is the sigma in x space? You read it from the formula. Sigma in x is equal to up. Fantastic. Now, if you remember the, I erase it, but if you remember the discussion I had before, you would probably recall that the sigma in momentum space, in wave vector, when I say momentum for the time being, think of wave vector. Mm? We'll see later on that this is in fact the momentum of the particle, apart from an h bar. But never mind. Okay? So the width in a wave vector space was 1 over 4 alpha. Mm? Okay? So this from my choice of uh, the wave function in wave vector space. And this comes by the, just doing the Fourier transform. Hmm? OK, I'll write it here. Sigma x squared equal to alpha. OK? So the product of these two objects is, in fact, independent of alpha. So sigma k squared times sigma x squared is equal to 1 quarter. OK? So you can make the wave function very narrow, say, in momentum space, and then you have it very wide in real space, or vice versa. But the product of the two widths is totally conserved. Okay? And in fact, if I take a square root, it is equal to one half. Hmm? And if I add an appropriate h bar, because after all the momentum I promised we'll see later on, and we saw it yesterday with De Broglie and all the story, P would be h bar k. This is nothing but uncertainty in momentum times uncertainty in x equal to h bar over 2, okay? Which is essentially an Heisenberg, um, the minimum uncertainty principle. In fact, uh, Heisenberg tells you that the uncertainty in P times the uncertainty in x should be uh, greater or equal to h bar over 2. We have here realized the equality sign. Okay? So the Gaussian functions that I wrote realize the minimum uncertainty okay, admitted by Heisenberg. But you might say, Heisenberg, I mean, this is Fourier transform. It is Fourier transform. 
Okay? So in some sense, Heisenberg is based on Fourier transform. In, in this, at least in this very simple representation of the story. Okay? Later on we will see a more general proof of this equality and in fact a more general proof for any two non-commuting operators, okay? But this will come later on. For the time being, I just want to, you to stay at the simplest uh, appearance of an uncertainty principle. Uh, in fact, in this case, uh, an equal, the minimum possible value, which is that the spread in X and the spread in K, or P, uh, cannot be less than a certain amount, which is, in appropriate units, one-half. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Now. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> so, so far, it's like, it's, I have a function, so it's like the analog of, say, a particle at a certain position x. Now it's become some spread out wave function. But the particles move, okay? How do I describe a particle that moves? Hmm? I need to have, hmm? I need to have some psi of x and t. I need to insert time now. How do I insert time? Hmm? Okay, let's see. Uh, mm. If I have a wave, a single wave, e to the i k x, okay, uh, what is the most natural uh, uh, way of having this wave to move? Let's see. Have you seen this before? Yeah. This is a wave, okay, for every instant of time is some plane wave, okay? But uh, as t changes, if I make photographs of this object, I will see that the wave shifts, okay? How do I see it? Well, <clears throat> Uh, it's simple. Just write this as e to the i k x minus omega k divided by k times t. Okay? So if I plot x minus this quantity times t, mm -hmm. this is still the same uh, wave that I had at the beginning. So somehow uh, this suggests that there is a velocity which is called the phase velocity, which is the omega that I put here divided by k, with which the wave advances. OK? Is it clear to everybody? Hmm? So if I write something like this, uh, there is an associated velocity with which the whole phase of this wave advances. And this phase velocity is omega k divided by k. Okay? <coughs> now, what should I uh, select? Hmm? What do you think is a good guess for omega k? This is the next crucial thing. For instance, you know that if I have electromagnetic waves, hmm, the phase velocity with which they move, all of them, in a medium that is non dispersing, so vacuum, hmm, or in any case, no index or fraction that depends on momentum, mm -hmm. then this omega k, the, this v of k, is just equal to c for all weights. Okay? So in some sense, for light, omega k is c times k, linear in momentum. <coughs> Unfortunately, this is not a good choice for us. Okay? We'll see in a second why. Mm? So we have to invent something different. Some omega k which is not clearer than k in order to describe something which is more the photograph of a non-relativistic particle moving in space. Okay? Let's see. So my suggestion here is 
that I write epsi of x and t, which is the integral over k, as before, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then I have the usual uh, phi of k that I had before. OK? So the c times uh, whatever. Hmm? But I multiply it by this factor here. OK? So rather than having just this, I have that each wave moves with a certain phase velocity. Hmm? Is it clear? OK? So the next goal is to calculate this and try to fix the omega k in such a way that this describes in a reasonable way a non-relativistic part. Hmm? Now, what is the uh, what is the problem uh, uh, with this with this uh, expression if omega k is equal to c k? Now, if omega k is equal to c times k, you can immediately uh, do the calculation and realize that this is equal to e to the i k x minus c t. Okay? So the calculation immediately tells you that this object is equal to the psi at position x minus c t times 0. Okay? So the whole wave moves okay, forward with the velocity c. Hmm? But certainly, this is not a very good representation of a relativistic, a non-relativistic part, right? Because you would um, somehow have something in which you can control uh, what is the velocity. And here, the velocity is fixed at this c. Hmm? So there is nothing really that I can... And in particular, I would like to have the velocity to be related to the mass somehow of this part. And here the mass doesn't appear anywhere. Okay? So we have to do something else. Okay? This is a good description of a non-dispersive wave, like light, but not <coughs> of a wave of a quantum mechanical non-relativistic part. Hmm? Okay. <coughs> In order to proceed hmm, with my calculation, I need to do this integral away, right? And without assuming the simple form, which would immediately give me the result. So how do I do? Well, a good approach is, so suppose that this is very well peaked around k0, okay? So this is c e to the minus uh, alpha k minus k0 square, and this alpha is such that somehow the width is small. Hmm? Then what you would do, okay, to calculate this object? But I would say, let me expand omega close to k0, right? Is it a reasonable thing to do? This is very well picked, okay? So to calculate the whole integral, I expand omega k close to k0. Okay, let's do it. So I write the following thing. I write that omega k is equal to the value in k0 plus some constant, okay? I will comment on this in a second, times a linear term, okay? So somehow, if I have some omega k dispersion, which I don't know exactly, at a certain point k0, the derivative there, okay? So d omega k over dk calculated in k0, I call it vg, okay? And that's the linear term in the Taylor expansion. Hmm? And then I add <laughs> a quadratic term, say, k minus k0 squared, plus other terms. Let's forget about them. Okay? Because I am assuming that somehow the integral is dominated by values near k0. Okay? So I can safely do a quadratic approximation of this omega k close to k0. Is it clear, everybody? Hmm? Yes or not? Yes. Good. Okay. Now, <coughs> I do almost exactly the same calculation as before, but I have to be careful with this thing here. Okay? I need some space, so I will erase back 
di questo. So let me write it. <coughs> um, so psi of x and t, it is equal to, I write it first, c integral over dk over square root of 2 pi from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus alpha k minus k0 squared. This is the phi of k. Hmm? And then I put here e to the i k <coughs> x okay minus <coughs> omega k i expand so it's omega k0 plus vg k minus k0 uh, plus beta k minus k0 squared, okay, multiplied by t. Okay, did you follow? I just substituted the expansion which I wrote there. Okay, let's stay of this thing. Provided 
the real part of A is positive. Why do I need the real part of A positive? For convergence, right? If the real part is negative, this would blow up for very large k. But if the real part is positive, the expression is still correct, even if I has an imaginary part. That's here. Okay. Very good. Now I <coughs> use the formula. I spare you a little bit of the algebra, not too much, because there are not many steps. Okay. And the result would be that the function is equal to c divided by the square root of 2 alpha plus i b t. Not this complex square root. No problem. You can cut the square root of complex numbers. e to the i k0 x minus omega k0 t times e to the minus x minus v g times t squared, remember, the square of the object, divided by 4 times no longer alpha, but alpha plus i beta t. Okay? This is the result of our calculation. So, given a wave packet where omega k has this behavior here, then the resulting object moves in the following way, moves, evolves in time in the following way. And the first thing that I notice is that if I calculate the modulus square, okay, and this is a phase factor in front, you can drop it, a little bit of k, I should multiply this times the complex conjugate of it. Okay, you have to do the calculation slowly, but it, it is not difficult, and you can verify the following thing. If this is 1 over the square root of 2 pi, then I have square root of alpha divided by alpha squared plus beta squared t squared, <coughs> and then I have e to the minus alpha x minus b g t squared divided by 2 alpha squared plus beta squared t squared. Okay? Now, don't be too much worried about this expression. In fact, let me just write it like this. Okay? And here as well, like this. Okay? So if I give you this expression, what would you say immediately? Oh, this is a Gaussian which moves with the velocity which is Vg. Okay? It advances with the velocity Vg. Notice, Vg is the derivative of the function. Not, remember that the phase velocity was not the derivative, was the omega divided by k. Okay? So don't confuse the, phase, the velocity with which each wave advances with the velocity with which the wave packet advances, okay? which is the group velocity, which is the derivative of the dispersion, not the dispersion divided by k. I call omega k the dispersion, okay, for obvious reasons. Okay? Good. So this moves forward with the group velocity, Mm -hmm. And you can read from here the width of this wave packet. Okay? I told you, every time you have a, a Gaussian like this, okay, the width of this Gaussian is whatever appears here. The, square, the sigma square is what you read from here. Okay? So sigma square of t is equal to alpha square plus beta squared t squared divided by alpha. Okay? So in fact, for t equals 0, you find alpha. And remember that sigma squared at time 0, the, the uncertainty in x was just alpha. Okay? Now this grows. Okay? So this starts from alpha plus beta squared alpha t squared. Okay? So if I have a certain alpha at the beginning, 
this grows. Okay? This is called the spreading of the wave packet. Sorry. Yeah. Doesn't this mean that at big times t the approximation gets wronger and wrong answers? Because in the beginning we assumed that the Gaussian packet was really narrow. No. And Taylor expanded. What, what was, was narrow in k? which means large in x. <laughs> okay? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Okay. So this is increasing in x. It was larger from the beginning. So, you know, in a second, we'll get rid of this uh, kind of, it seems that our derivation is only valid for narrow wave packets in momentum space. We will see in a second. So just hold on for a second, okay? So, the spread in, in x, increases. So if the wave packet is somehow at a certain width, at, the, at time t equals zero, you take a snapshot, and then you let it move. It moves with the group velocity, but it also spreads. Hmm? This is inevitable. It doesn't depend really on the second derivative of this function, because you see it's beta squared that occurs. So it doesn't really depend how you make the curvature of this. Uh, as long as this is a non-linear function, so it's not this, sure, then this wave packet spreads. Okay? And this happens to light also in a dispersive medium. If you take a, a, a light wave, hmm, an electromagnetic wave in a medium like a crystal or so, huh, the, uh, the, the wave, if you make it concentrate, spreads inevitably. Okay? Because the different waves of different k advance with slightly different velocities, okay? Remember, not all velocity, phase velocities are the same. They change a little bit with the k, and this makes spreading of the wave packet. Is it clear so far? Okay, now, let's conclude the story. Uh, to conclude the story, I have to make contact with non-relativistic classical mechanics. This is the object, okay? Remember, we started from this idea. Now, uh, I would like, I would, uh, so if I have a, a non-relativistic particle, what do you think is the velocity with which this particle advances? Huh? It is less than the velocity of light, for sure, but is it connected to the momentum in some way? M over 2 M? M, just M. The velocity is the momentum divided by M. <coughs> the 2 is the kinetic energy. Okay? This is clear. So I want this. But I also know, <coughs> I also know, according to Compton, De Broglie, okay, the momentum of this particle should be somehow related to the wavelength in this way. Okay? So somehow this is the De Broglie uh, relationship. Okay? So this is Newton, classical mechanics. Velocity, momentum divided by mass. Hmm? This is the De Broglie. So H bar enters and tells me that the momentum is related to the wavelength. Mm. Okay. But if I have this, mm, then can you tell me what omega k has to be in order for its velocity, which is the derivative at k0, to be linear in k0? Okay. The solution of these two equations is that omega k is equal to h bar k squared over 2 m. Let's verify. Okay? So I take a derivative of this. Okay? The 2 cancels the 2, and I have h bar k over m. Then I calculate that k0, which is what I need. Okay? And I find h bar k0 over m, okay? Which is okay so we have found the solution and the solution is that the dispersion that I have to put in my 
equation is not the linear dispersion of uh, light, but a quadratic dispersion. Nothing could be, in fact, simpler somehow. Okay? So you shouldn't think of a very bizarre function, just a parabola. A parabola does the job. Hmm? And also, I remind you of the following interesting facts. If I calculate h bar omega, okay, remember Planck, this should be the energy somehow, or related to the energy, hmm? and in fact this would be h bar square k square over m. And h bar k is the momentum according to the Bray. So this is just p square over 2m. So the energy is in fact classical kinetic energy. So everything seems to fit. Hmm? So the picture is kind of consistent. Now, this is not a derivation, you understand, right? It's just a familiarization with some of the concepts, okay? Um, width in momentum space, in, uh, and using some of the ideas that somehow were uh, around at the beginning of quantum mechanics to make you comfortable with the fact that somehow the dispersion that I should use in my um, theory is a quadratic dispersion where the mass appears and which closely mimic the classical kinetic energy. Okay? So, no derivation, but make you just comfortable with some of these uh, tools. Fantastic. Now, incidentally, I, I do have a little exercise to show to you that um, now the role of the mass is quite crucial and the role of the fact that h bar is a very, very small number. If you, for instance, um, try to calculate how much, say, the, the wave packet spreads in one second uh, for a particle of a given mass, hmm? you would see that if the particle has the mass of the electron, then the spreading is uh, significant. If the particle has a macroscopic mass, like one gram, then the spread is absolutely um, insignificant. Okay? So somehow um, uh, the masses entering into the game together with h bar, it makes a difference in the prediction that you make if this is a gram or 10 to the minus 31 grams, given the fact that this is a very small number of the order of, again, 10 to the minus 30 something. Okay? So you immediately see that uh, microsco atomic quantities and everyday uh, masses do play a very different role because h bar has a precise value which is somehow dictating uh, the physics. Okay? Okay, there are a number of exercises that I suggest just to familiarize with some of this calculation, which is, for instance, calculating it's very simple things. So suppose that um, suppose that my initial function, okay, it's very simple, it's just um, A if uh, I am inside a certain region between minus a and a, okay? So this is a, and zero outside, okay? Just a square well, mm -hmm. and I ask you to just determine the Fourier transform, phi of k, of it, and then mm -hmm. um, calculate psi of x and t mm -hmm. by just using the expression we have developed. But now, don't put here the Gaussian. This is not a Gaussian, okay? The Fourier transform of this thing is in fact a very simple function, okay? It's a sign of the Although the integral can be more complicated because Gaussian integrals are simple in some sense, while some other integrals might be hard to calculate, okay? So I ask you to familiarize a little bit with these concepts. Maybe we should also um, see each other to do a little bit of, uh, of this uh, gymnastic, okay? Just to, for instance, one exercise that you can 
um, do has to do with Fourier series, okay? So try to um, make sense of Fourier series and Fourier integrals. So exercise 1.5 is an instructive exercise that guides you through that, okay? But now let me cut the story. So try to do the exercise and maybe we rediscuss some of the features of the that I ask. Um, but now I want to discuss with you the Schrodinger equation for a free particle in space. Now, according to the discussion I gave, somehow this wave packet should describe the evolution of a free particle in space. Okay? And you can make it perfectly meaningful in, in terms of this uh, quantum. Okay? Now, I want to prove to you that the solution we just wrote before is in fact a solution of the following equation i h bar the derivative of psi of x and t equal to minus h bar second derivative with respect to x squared psi of x and t okay this is called the Schrodinger equation hmm? for a free particle in 1D. Free particle, there is no potential, okay, so V is equal to zero, the potential, and it's in one dimension because I just use X. Incidentally, the generalization to three dimension is very, very simple. The derivative in three dimension, you would have the following thing. This is now x vector in three dimension, and this is minus h bar square over 2m, second derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to y, second derivative with respect to z, psi of x and t. Okay? This object here has a name, it's called the Laplacian. And I indicate like this, okay? By the way, mathematicians like this, okay? Without the two. I like the two here because there is another uh, operator which is probably known to you by electromagnetism, which is the gradient, okay? If I have a function, the gradient of the function is a three-component vector with the derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to y, and the derivative with respect to z, right? And if I ask you, take the scalar product of the gradient with the gradient and apply it to a function, then what do we do? Formally, formally, when I have two vectors, the scalar product is x component of this times x component of this plus y times y plus z times z. Okay? So this is equal to x and x is the second derivative with respect to x squared. Plus y times y is the second derivative with respect to y. Plus, sorry, it's too small. I shouldn't write in small spaces. My fault. Okay. Okay. So gradient times gradient applied to psi is second derivative with respect to x plus second derivative with respect to y plus second derivative with respect to z applied to the function. Okay? So you see immediately that somehow the formal scalar product of the gradient operator with itself is nothing but 
the Laplace, and that's the reason why I write it like this. Okay? And again, in the mathematical literature, you would find the opposite uh, triangle without the square. Okay? Never mind, everybody likes its own notation. Mm? Okay, so this is in 3D. Obviously, in 2D, you would have this, okay? In 1D, just a simple second derivative. Now, <clears throat> I want to prove to you that what we wrote before is in fact a solution of this equation. Remember what we wrote, okay? We wrote the psi of x and t was the integral over dk, okay, of a phi of k times e to the i k x minus omega k t. That's what we wrote. And I'm not going here to specify in particular that this is a Gaussian. Any phi, okay? If I write the psi of x and t with any phi, hmm, then this is a solution of this equation. Okay? Shall we verify it? It's very simple. Okay. <clears throat> I erase. It's a linear differential equation. You see, psi appears linearly. That doesn't mean that the operators that appear in front of the psi have to be first order derivatives. Okay? Any derivatives is still a linear operator applied to psi. So if I have psi 1 and psi 2, and both of them satisfy, the sum also satisfies it. Okay? So the linearity of the equation is an important concept. And by the way, it survives even in presence of a potential. The Schrodinger equation is always a linear equation in the psi, in the wave function. Even for very complicated system made of many particles, doesn't really matter. Linearity is there from the start. Hmm? Good. So, suppose that I tell you Okay, let's satisfy if this object here uh, satisfies the equation, okay? If I satisfy for this, then obviously even the integral over k satisfies it because it's a combination of these objects, okay? So, let's do the exercise. I, h bar, the derivative with respect to t mm, of a single plane wave like this, e to the i, kx minus omega kt. Okay? Let's calculate. This is the left hand side of the equation. Hmm? How much is this? I, h bar, take a derivative with respect to t, you bring down minus i omega k. Minus i omega k hmm? times the same function. Fantastic. Okay? Now let's look at the right hand side. Okay? So I want minus h bar square over 2m. The second derivative, okay? So derivative of the derivative of e to the i kx minus omega kt. Okay? I take the first derivative and I bring down ik. So this brings ik times the same function. Now I take a second derivative. Okay? And what I get? Minus k squared. Ik squared. So minus k squared. Hmm? So the result of the calculation is minus, and the minus is a plus h bar squared, k squared over 2m e to the i kx minus omega k. Okay? Now, here I have i times minus i, so I have h bar omega k. Are these two things equal? Yes. 
Well, yes, they are, provided you take <coughs> omega k, or if you want h bar omega k, equal to h bar k squared over 2n, which is the dispersion, quadratic dispersion, which I insisted we should take. Okay? So if we take that dispersion, each single plane waves in this form satisfies the Schrodinger equation. Hmm? But then, it's a very simple matter to convince yourself, due to linearity, that the Psi is satisfied. Hmm? And if you are not infinitely sure about this concept of linearity, just, <coughs> just, uh, uh, just do it explicitly. So I h bar, the derivative with respect to t of the Psi, hmm? you bring it in and you calculate from here. Okay? Then you calculate the derivative with respect to x, bring it in, and you you just bring down the k square from here, and you look, you stare at your equation and you say, ah, it's the same. Okay? So somehow this integral over phi, it's a kind of very, very simple uh, object which doesn't change the essence of the derivation, which is what I wrote there. Okay? If you bring that inside the derivatives. Okay? Good. Now, what about three dimension? Well, obviously, I have to generalize my plane waves. What is the generalization of a plane wave in three dimension? I have to introduce a three component wave vector k hmm? and write k dot x. Okay, so this is e to the i kx x plus ky y okay plus k z z okay and what about this term well this term is simply minus omega k t or how should I take the omega k you can verify that the omega k is simply equal to h bar the modulus of k squared over 2n. So the sum of kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared over 2n. Okay? If you use this uh, three-dimensional prescription, which are the obvious generalization of this one-dimensional writing, and you use here the Laplacian rather than the second derivative, everything comes out immediately. Straightforward generalization. Okay? I don't do the algebra because it's just adding more components. Okay? Clear? Okay. So, not only the Gaussian wave packet we calculated before, but any wave packet written in this way with any wave function satisfies the Schrodinger equation in absence of potential. Okay? In particular, what we wrote before, the Gaussian ones, are the ones that satisfy the minimum uncertainty principle at time t equals zero. Okay? And then there is a spreading. All right? Good. <coughs> there is one more operator. Uh, so, what do I mean by operators? Operators, I mean things that act on the wave functions. So you act on the wave function, for instance, by multiplying it by some number or some function, or taking a derivative. Okay? So, for instance, this object is an operator acting on C. Okay? This object is an operator, the Laplacian operator, acting on C. Okay? So when I say operator, just think of something acting on, okay, with a derivative or some function multiplying the psi. Okay, <clears throat> now, there is a particular useful operator that in fact we already encountered, is the gradient. Hmm? And I want to somehow uh, hint to you that the momentum operator, okay, is essentially, apart from i and h bar, the gradient, okay? Let's see why. Remember, 
according to De Broglie, the momentum should be related to the wavelength or the K by this relationship. Let's see if this works. Okay? Let's apply to a plane wave. A plane wave is something where I have a well-definite wavelength, which is related to K. Hmm? Now, let's calculate the uh, gradient of this thing. Okay? So, I will do it. Should I do it fast or slow? Fast. Fast. <laughs> because you are bored. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a very reasonable thing. Hmm? <laughs> now, this object here is kx x plus ky y plus kzz. So if I take the x component, which is derivative with respect to x, I bring down this. If I take the y component, which is the derivative with respect to y, I bring down this. And the z component, I bring down this. Okay? So the end result is that I bring down this is there, and I bring down I K. Okay? I did it fast, but I mean you understand, right? So every time I bring down the appropriate component, okay, and the result is this vector k. Then i and minus i is a plus one, and therefore this is h bar k e to the i k dot x. Okay? So indeed, the plane wave, you see here? The plane wave is an eigenfunction of this operator P with eigenvalue h bar k. Let me stress this. If I have an operator and I want to know, so any operator or any matrix, linear algebra, whatever, and I want to know the eigenvectors, okay, uh, the eigenvectors are such that if I apply the operator, the matrix, to the vector, I obtain something proportional to the vector. Okay? And the object is called the eigenvalue. Hmm? Now I have this operator, which is the gradient. I apply it to this function here, which is the vector. Hmm? And what I obtain is the same vector. Okay? So formally this is A, V, equal to lambda v. Okay? So this is the eigenvector eh? and this is the eigenvalue. It's a number. Well, it's a vector number, but it's a number. Okay? So you see, this is an operator, something that acts by taking derivatives, and these are e the eigenvectors or eigenfunctions, I would call them in this contest, and this is the eigenvalue. Hmm? Okay? Do you make, are you comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. It's just the generalization to functions of the concept of linear algebra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apparently this is perfectly compatible with the De Broglie relationship. So my good guess would be that the momentum operator mm -hmm. is minus i h bar, the gradient operator acting on wave function. Okay? Fantastic. And one last thing, and then we kind of pause for a second, is the following. Let's consider <coughs> the momentum operator. Now, to distinguish it from an ordinary uh, vector, let's, let me put the hat. Hat, whenever I put the hat, means this is an operator. This is not just a, a, a number or a vector number. Okay? So, this object scalar product with itself. Okay? You, how would you call this? What symbol would you invent? The square, right? If I write P square, okay, it's just P dot P. Hmm? But this is equal to <coughs> minus I H bar square the gradient dotted into the gradient, which is the Laplacian, right? Okay, so this is minus and minus is a plus, but I squared is a minus, h bar squared, the Laplacian, okay? 
Very good. And what do I have here? I have exactly the same expression, except that there is a factor 2m. So this object here, I can rewrite it as p operator square divided by 2m. Okay? The classical kinetic energy would be p squared over 2m, where p is a number or a vector. Hmm? In <coughs> quantum mechanics, you take the operator, which is minus i h bar the gradient, you square it in the sense of operators, you get essentially the Laplacian, hmm? apart from coefficient in front, and from a conspicuous minus sign. This is some positive quantity, it's a kinetic energy, it's a positive thing. But you need a minus in front, it comes out. You will see this later on also, reappear. It's a very strange thing. You will think that the positive thing needs to have pluses. Not always. Okay? <coughs> All right. Good. This concludes this first briefing on uh, how you describe a free particle in space by using wave packet and by writing a Schrodinger equation for the wave function rather than, as in classical mechanics, writing the Hamilton's equation, which, by the way, would be very simple for a free particle, just free motion. Hmm? Okay? As you see, I mean, it's considerably why the classical motion of a free particle is very easy to describe. Here there is considerable machinery, wave function, Laplacian things, the partial differential equations. They are linear, but they are partial differential equations. So the thing can easily become a complex, especially, especially if you have a potential. Okay? So the, the genius of Heisenberg was to understand that if I want to and this came from his understanding of optics. He knew very well um, optics and he understood that uh, the right equation to write, to describe the motion of a particle in a general three-dimensional potential is P squared over 2m, the kinetic energy we wrote before, plus the potential okay, times psi of x and t. Okay? This object here is called the quantum Hamiltonian. It's an operator made of two terms. One is the kinetic energy which we already encountered for a free part. Then you sum the potential energy. Whatever it is, it's an harmonic oscillator, well, then it's x squared times something. It is an hydrogen atom minus e squared divided by the distance from the nucleus. Okay? Anything hmm, you can recapture into a potential hmm, and write in a Newtonian. And in principle, if I solve this equation, I know everything about my quantum system. Okay? <coughs> Obviously, this is in general a formidable thing, even for a single particle. Hmm? Formidable. It is exactly solvable for very special cases. Harmonic oscillators, typically. Hydrogen atom is solvable, we will do it explicitly, but if I give you a potential, hmm? and I ask you, okay, calculate the evolution of the wave function, it's a nightmare, a real nightmare. Okay? Why, if I give you a potential and they say, okay, calculate the classical equation of motion, but, I mean, you have to write the three coordinates, the three momenta, okay, it's a six-dimensional vector moving in, in phase space, you can calculate. You just uh, run your computer and you calculate. There's chaos that uh, somehow is, so, you can calculate for a while, okay? And if the potential is uh, a bit strange, typically the motion is very erratic, okay? But this is another story, okay? So classically, the equations are simple, but uh, they might be uh, very, very sensitive to the initial condition we get, okay? Which is called the chaos in classical mechanics. Hmm? 
In this case, it's a deterministic evolution, but this, every time you have to evolve a function, not a single point. So can you imagine I mean, the complication? You can expand this function into a basis of states, for instance Fourier, but you have an infinite number of coefficients to follow. Hmm? So it's a very, very complicated thing to do, okay, in general, even numerically. <coughs> okay. Um, now let me just um, proceed with a little bit of uh, uh, formal tools because we need to advance our machinery. Okay? We are building little by little the objects that we need with functions, operators like the momentum, kinetic energy, but we want to learn how to um, uh, do things with them. Hmm? Um, <coughs> there is a very uh, uh, useful uh, object and concept which is given an operator <coughs> the exponential of the operator okay so if I have an operator O, I call it O, it's a generic thing it might be the, the, the Hamiltonian, just the kinetic energy, any operator hmm? you can think of constructing the exponential of it. How do you do it? Nothing could be simpler. Just use the uh, Taylor expansion. So it's 1 plus O plus 1 over 2 factorial O square plus O thirds okay? of the usual uh, exponential Taylor expansion. Okay? I can write it formally as the sum from 0 to infinity of the operator to the power n divided by n factor. Okay? So you see the exponential involves all powers of the operator. Hmm? This seems like, well, okay, who cares? But think of the exponential of the Laplacian. Okay? So the first term is the Laplacian. And then you have the Laplacian square. And then the Laplacian cubed. Four, fifth. Okay? More and more derivatives. Kind of a mess. Okay? So don't take it as a piece of cake. It is a useful concept, but not something tremendously easy to calculate. And in particular, unlike uh, exponential of complex uh, numbers, if the two, if you have two operators, okay, and you calculate the uh, a product of the two exponential, in general, that's different from the sum of the two, okay. Now, there is here immediately one concept that I have to stress. Operators, unlike numbers, are sensitive to the position where they act. Okay? You say that they, in general they do not commute. Okay? Let me show the simplest example of two operators that do not commute. Okay? <coughs> What operators have we encountered so far? Well, P. Okay, let's do it in 1D, because otherwise I have to. Okay? So P as an operator is minus i h bar the derivative with respect to x. Another operator, x. x. Now you might say, what do you mean x? Well, x as an operator acts on the wave function by just multiplying it by x. Okay? Notice the subtle difference. Here I view it as an operator. Here I view it as I mean the ordinary x thing. Okay? Good. Nevertheless, this is an operator, hmm? which acts in a very simple way, but it does. Hmm? Okay, now let's calculate P x applied to a wave file. As, actually, let's first do the opposite. Okay? Let's calculate this object. I first apply p and then x. The order is the order in which they are closer to the uh, wafer. Okay? So this object is x and then I have minus i h bar, the derivative applied to the psi. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay? Then x applied to this function 
is simply multiplication by x. So this is equal to x times minus h by the derivative of x. Okay? Very good. Let's calculate the opposite. P x psi. Okay, I first apply x. So this is equal to P apply to x psi of x. Next I apply P. So I have to apply minus i h bar the derivative acting on x psi x. Hmm? The derivative acting on a product of two function, I have to apply the product rule. So the derivative of this plus the derivative of that. So when I take the derivative of the first term, I get minus i h bar times psi of x. And then I have plus x times minus i h bar the derivative of psi. Okay? So you see, this is exactly the same. But this is new. Okay? So when P acts to the left, there is an extra term. The two objects do not commute. Okay? And in fact, one can define the concept of the commutator of two operators. Okay? The commutator of two operators is defined to be the action of the two minus the action of the reversed. Okay? This is a very general definition. So if I do it for x and p, let's see. Okay? This is x times p minus p times x. Okay? Good. How much is this? Let's see. Okay? You know the answer, of course. Okay? Let's apply to a function. Okay? If I do this calculation that I did already, you would realize that this is equal to i h bar psi of x. Okay? Any function. Okay? So in some sense, the commutator of x and p should be i h bar. Okay? Doesn't matter what the function is. Okay? So operators do not commute in general. For instance, when you take derivatives and when you multiply by function, careful to the uh, thing and the this is called the fundamental commutation relationship between the position and the momentum operator. They do not commute. So next time we'll continue with a little bit with the machinery of operators, exponential things, and so on and so forth. Okay? A bit of formal machinery. Hmm? We'll stop here. Okay.